Hello and welcome to the VIEW Meetup Online. My name is Eva Howe and I am with the Stott Labs, um, who is our sponsor. We are a tech consultancy. We do all things front-end and JavaScript. Um, we specialize in open source software, which is why we're here today to talk about VIEW. So if you need any help with any of these things, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Um, we've got a couple more things coming up. Uh, we do, we're going to do an Angular online on October 3rd. We're going to do React online on October 10th and another View online on October 17th. So we'd love to see you at all of those. And then today our speakers are going to be Simone and Charles. And our little schedule of how this is all going to do, I'm doing my little welcome talk right now. And then Charles is going to be up first followed by Simone, um, and then we'll do some closing notes and goodbye. And just to give you guys a heads up, in between, um, if you all have questions about the talks, please go ahead and put them in the chats, and we will try to answer questions in between talks or at the end of a talk. So that's it. Let me just unshare my screen, and then Charles, you can take it away. Thank you so much. Let me go ahead and share mine. I am, oh no, I am missing my, you can give me one second, oh no. Here we go. So let me make sure it'll let me share. And that is not, there we go. <laughs> All right, and we're off to the races. So thank you, um, Eva, for the introduction, and thank you, uh, Vista, for having me. Um, I'm very excited about uh, being able to present here today. So um, the title of my talk is uh, Ramp Up to View. Um, it's gonna be rather introductory. Uh, and as Eva mentioned, my name is Charles Villard. I'm a web engineer at Tenet Partners. I randomly tweet stuff at CD Villard on Twitter. And I'd actually like to start this talk uh, a couple of years ago, in fact, um, it was the one and only thus far CodePen meetup that we had in Miami, Florida. A friend of mine hosted it alongside Chris Coyer of CSS Tricks. And when I got there, everyone was presenting uh, these really cool front end projects and render examples. Um, in Miami, we don't tend to do a whole lot of flashy design stuff, but there was a lot of really cool engineering things going on. And I was feeling some FOMO. So uh, I wanted to present and I racked my brain for something and I ended up presenting a table uh, made with jQuery with rows that would open up on hover for showing details. Um, and in the, in the midst of the uh, whole front end framework bonanza that was going on at the time, not really what you would call a, a crowd pleaser. Uh, so, but the truth of the matter is that was my reality at the time. Um, it was the state of my career then. I was working in jQuery and I was working with SAS and with gulp tasks and grunt on giant .NET web form applications. Uh, and sometimes I would get to work with some static site generators, but for the most part, I was working on these large uh, code bases, uh, monolithic in size. Uh, they had been developed over 15 years and there wasn't a whole lot in the way of pre-planned modernization, um, but that is enterprise web development in a nutshell. If you're not familiar with it, you might hear, hear it as corporate. Some people like to just bucket it all into legacy development. Um, but that, I mean, that's the nature of it. You work with what you have and whatever works. Um, and that's not to knock it. And this talk is not to knock any of those tools. They're all very powerful and still in use today. Um, in fact, if you run a, an Indeed search for front end web developer or web developer, it's a very good chance that you're going to find requests for every one of those tools um, now. Um, the truth of the matter, though, is that all of those areas, enterprise, corporate, legacy, whether you, you bucket them all together or you separate them, their main goal is solving internal business problems. Um, so when you're thinking of that, think of things like a uh, corporate intrasite, um, investor websites, um, systems management applications. If you're working with large machinery, I, like I did as a pre-press technician, you would have little applications that you could use to make, send messages to and from the machinery. Um, in the job, in the particular role that I was describing, uh, at the time we were working on, and are still working on, brand management websites. 
and this is where you would go to get all your marketing materials if you ran a large company that way you have your fonts on point and your logos looking right and your colors and your message um, correct um, but the thing is when you're looking at enterprise development and internal applications a lot of the time UX gets uh, sort of left behind as an afterthought. Performance is not the first thing on your mind. It's get it done. Um, but my team and I, we saw the writing on the walls. We understood that user experience is a business problem because even on internal applications, why would you want to deter productivity and interaction with a lack of speed or interactivity? We wanted to make sure that marketing teams, branding teams, anyone who might have access to this kind of content would have it as quickly as possible instead of having to wait and wait and wait uh, for load times, for large files to download, for servers to catch up. And so I decided at the time as a more junior developer, I, wanted, I was really excited about all this new technology. And so I took it on myself to find a front-end framework that we could use um, in the middle of all of this code uh, and that would allow us to eventually modernize the application. And the main goals that we laid out were that it wouldn't require major rewrites. We didn't want to have to do a whole bunch of rewriting up front uh, for it to be useful. And then we also wanted to have a, pro a progressive upgrade path where we'd be able to start somewhere and then find our way to making it a modern component-based application. Um, and so after, not long after I started my research, I hit a framework fatigue wall pretty hard, you know, sort of that I can do it, I can do it, I can do it, no. Um, and this is despite you know, the obvious front runners available, such as React, such as Angular. We were looking at as many options as possible. And the truth of the matter is I was doing that and it was a ton of different approaches. Some had huge ecosystems, some didn't have a whole lot. Um, and it didn't help that I was a fresher developer at the time because it really made it hard to separate the signal from the noise for me. Um, and at the time we also did look into Vue um, but through that lens of framework fatigue, at first glance, it did to me at least seem like it was more of the same. Um, thankfully, uh, I was active on Twitter at the time, and it was that Twitter front end community, especially the very compassionate community that builds up around view that encouraged me to give it another look, that encouraged me to try it again. So I delved right into the docs um, and started from fre started a, a fresh. Uh, eventually, I, I tend to learn better with video. So I turned to front-end masters and I tried to address this intro to uh, Vue.js course, and that really is what got it rolling for me. Um, I learned enough to start building a small document suggestion uh, single page application at work that was integrated into the current code base without a whole lot of uh, rewriting of, of code. It was fresh code, but we didn't have to rework um, whole pages to get it to, to work. We didn't have to in, incorporate new compile steps. It integrated very smoothly. And that's something that I always enjoyed about Vue and something I still do today, something I imagine as this very smooth and steady on-ramp up to mastery. And I find that it's both very useful for learning as well as for uh, productivity. Um, I've never had this need to like learn everything all at once. I was able to piece everything together in time uh, as I needed it, which felt very different from uh, other frameworks out there where if you started using it, there's a buy-in and, you and your code needs to be structured this way or you need to use these methods because of the view the built in um, a built-in sort of recognition of the separation of concerns that a lot of people are used to, Vue was able to really knock it out of the park um, in terms of being accessible to use. Um, and this is also thanks in large part to uh, the community that drives this development and its adoption. Um, and I just want to take a sec quick second to acknowledge people like the core team, not just, you know, Evan Yu, but also Chris Fritz, um, Guillaume Shao, Raul, who do a lot of work and pour a lot of um, effort into building view educators like uh, Sarah Drasner, Greg Pollock, Adam Jar, uh, the meetup organizers such as Alice Hernandez, Jen Looper, Krista Mars from Detroit, um, and other community partners that sort of help us learn like this doc. Um, these are people that aren't just building great content, but they're also very empathetic to learning. Um, and it's really made Vue just very easy. I mean, in my opinion, it's, it's really as simple as the script tag. Um, and this is not uncommon. 
uh, you see other libraries that tend to be, you know, you can add a script tag and it can be very productive, but it, I, you don't have to add multiple script tags with view. You don't have to um, be concerned about uh, too much beyond just this. Uh, and it's very simple. Um, so in, at this point in my presentation, I'm gonna go ahead and this is more so for the people who are just getting into Vue, who, who are really interested in learning and looking for that sort of path to understanding like, okay, what do I need to know? That 20%, that'll do 80% of the work. And this is in just my opinion, and I'm no professional educator, um, and I'm still learning a lot with Vue. This is my opinion about what, um, what people should really look into when it comes to Vue. So I just want to go over this high level really quick. Um, you, you'll be able to look at more and more of this in the docs and in other uh, resources that I want to highlight in a second. So as I mentioned, adding it to your site, a uh, pre-existing project, really simple as a script tag. Um, beyond that, one of the first things you're going to run into is this concept of declarative data binding. The declarative data binding, excuse me. <clears throat> Instantiating an, uh, a view, an instance of view is as simple as, you know, calling new view open parentheses like you would a function and then passing in an, op, uh, an object of options. And this is known as the view options syntax. Um, and we're gonna talk, a, I'll touch on that a little bit more later. But by associating a piece of HTML with an ID to this, as you see on line two of the JavaScript, you have an L property with a CSS selector for ID. IDs are preferable. Uh, you can already start building a small spa or small widget right into your um, right into your uh, current existing website. And I, if you have a personal website that you want to use to play around with um, to learn view, I would highly recommend trying to build something you know small toy like. Um, a great uh, a great example would be if you have for, for using view in a pre existing website is if you had anything that might be. Uh, boilerplate in a website. So the reason why I say that, if you look at the data function, the data method on line three, um, you're returning your data as additional properties in a new object. Um, and message correlates to anywhere that message appears in the HTML and the double brackets on the left hand side. Link is a literal um, is a literal anchor tag. It's a string for a URL. Um, and you can bind that to the href attribute of say a link element by using uh, vbind. And this is why I say declarative data binding. Technically the vbind is something a little else, um, but it is very useful. It, but it is very useful to understand this now as you're able, as there are often times where you want to programmatically build uh, an element um, and you need to understand how ahead of time how would you want to say uh, input the, the data for a particular attribute? Um, and so the, using a vbind uh, as declaratively as it is on line four or just the shorthand colon on line six, um, learning that ahead of time can be pretty powerful. Um, next up would be directives. And I, I won't dive too much into directives right now, but directives are little attributes in themselves that you can add to different elements that uh, gi that give a uh, view something to, to look for. And once it finds it, it can work, so work out some pretty powerful uh, magic on its own. Um, in this case, if you look at the screenshot, we have a V4 directive attached to the LIs. And if and it basically stands for view, uh, views uh, for loop, so to speak. Um, in this case, it's just iterating over numbers, but I can't, I can't imagine that anyone here hasn't run into needing to write some kind of a list um, that can get repetitive having to write li, li, li. Um, and it can do it for you, but when you need to do it programmatically, views already, have, already has that built in. Um, I do have a link, of, uh, as you can see on the slide, to uh, a example code bin that goes through a lot of the directives. And these will be available later. I'll make sure to post this on Twitter. Um, there's also more about that on the documents, as you can see. Uh, next up would be methods and computed properties. Now, methods are basically little pieces of functionality that you write into the view instance um, that allow you to uh, that allow you to 
do things such as increment or decrement a number, as you can see in the screenshot. Um, and they're, they're basically you know, just little functions um, and allows you to be as composed as you want uh, with what your application needs to do. Um, this is different from computed properties, where you're just simply taking data that's available and transforming it in a way. Now, methods and computed often can do pretty much the exact same thing, but the benefit of a computed property is that it is cached. So that is free performance, as everyone likes to describe it, right out of the box and is available to you um, without any additional uh, know-how or need. It's all cached. It's what it makes uh, applications uh, just a little bit faster um, and can save a lot of time and headaches. Um, and beyond that, when, once you're comfortable with that, uh, there's also component, uh, the component templates. Now this is where you begin to start to see some of the composability of Vue.js. Um, there are many ways I have, as you can see, a link to Anthony Gore's article at Vue.js.developers.com uh, uh, that lists a few ways uh, to uh, define these templates. Um, per, my personal favorite are the X templates, and they seem a little bit uh, janky. Really, they're script tags with a type of text forward, uh, forward slash X template, but they allow you to compose uh, different components. Within a within a small script tag, and this is, I think, in my in my opinion, a great introduction to uh, sort of a step a, clo a step closer to single file components. Um, it, it just sort of in the same way that you have the separation of concerns when you look at uh, the the full view application. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, okay. So the same way that. Uh, Thank you. The same way that you have a full um, view application. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, with that said, um, I think those are ultimately a great, uh, there's a few things that you can start learning that will really um, help you push, help anyone new to view push forward and, and get into it. Um, it, once, you're, once you have a better understanding of those, I think uh, there are a number of resources that are available um, that could help uh, someone grow that much further. Um, <clears throat> so a few of them that are highlighted here, I have you, you know, View Mastery, View School. Um, there's also two courses available on Front End Masters if you want to give them a shot. I, I cannot recommend enough Sarah Drasner's course. Um, she's, uh, she wrote a great piece of content um, in that course, and it's extremely uh, well-written, well-in-depth. Uh, Evan Yu also teaches the Advanced View course uh, on Frontend Masters. And then there's also um, the Awesome View uh, resource, uh, the Awesome View repository on GitHub uh, that has even more tutorials and links to uh, meetups and conferences, and I would definitely recommend anyone interested check that out. So, as I mentioned before, this uh, smooth and uh, the smooth on ramp up to view into up to mastery of view um, has come with you know the work of the core team and all of the, their partners and uh, the community at large. Um, but like many frameworks, something else to keep in mind when you're learning view is that uh, frameworks change. Um, and a lot of it is improvement, it's in its growth, its evolution, um, but these things can scale very quickly. Um, and so touching back on my previous experience trying to research uh, front-end frameworks, um, that on-ramp to mastery for a lot, of, a lot of tools in general can start out very smooth and very simple as, you know, as they're beginning to grow, though they can end up looking a bit more like this, uh, or at least, you know, Perceptively so, it sort of becomes a bit more of a climb. Um, and as I mentioned, a lot of the changes can be good. New developer experience, new features, new patterns, new practices, uh, better performance. But there's also potentially breaking changes. Um, and these are, again, not necessarily bad things, but they can be confusing, especially to newer developers who aren't quite used to 
uh, a front-end framework. Maybe this is their first time looking at a front-end framework. Um, this personally was a big part of my front framework critique, as, as Vue is probably one of the first front-end frameworks that I really dove into head, uh, uh, wholeheartedly. Um, but the, but the benefit, one of the benefits of having the core team um, behind Vue is that they are very, very uh, transparent about these changes. And the best place to learn about those changes are the requests for comments. Um, they have it as a repository currently on GitHub, and you can read through all of these, uh, all the changes that may be suggested for upcoming versions of Vue. Um, <clears throat> they've been extremely transparent and vocal about anything that they think might be available and have been very open to considering uh, ch changes from outside parties as well. All the RFCs uh, that get submitted are open to con uh, for comment um, and community feedback is really what drives Vue's growth um, and it really is a great way. It's really the way that Vue's going to shape itself moving forward. Um, I think also finding ways to contribute is another great way to get start getting into Vue. Um, and so just to highlight a few of them, the big one is of course, any substantial changes. And what does substantial changes uh, mean? Uh, that means new features that creates new API surface area. So anything, any new versions of a lifecycle hook, for example, um, it could also be changes to the semantics or the behavior of currently existing API. Uh, it's also removing features that may have already been shipped, but aren't as productive, perhaps. Um, and it can also be just new idiomatic usage or conventions. Um, maybe you have experience in another language and are interested in, in Vue and you find that something from your previous experience can be helpful. That's potentially something that you could suggest. Um, and that last one seems like a very, good entry point for anyone who wants to contribute, but they don't want to get too deep into the code. Um, you know, maybe they're not as experienced with JavaScript or all of the dark machinations behind how uh, JavaScript works. I think that would be a great way to, uh, to get started. Um, other ways that people can contribute are commenting on those PRs that have already been submitted and then suggesting improvements to the RFC itself. It's very, it's very new. It only started earlier this year. And I would highly recommend if you are interested, please uh, take a look and give it a shot. Um, and so with that, I, I, I'm a little afraid I might be a little bit over time, but so I'm gonna end it now. Um, thank you so much uh, for your time, um, for checking this out. Uh, thank you, Ava, for hosting and this dot uh, for having me. And um, if anyone has any questions or if you would like to see the links in the slides, I'll make sure to tweet this out. I'm at CD Villard again on Twitter. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Does anybody have any questions? I don't see any in the chat. Um, does anybody have any they'd like to add right now? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a no. Uh, Simone, you are up next. Fantastic. Can you all hear me and see me? Yes. So let me get started and share my screen. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes. It's good. So let's start. First of all, I would like to uh, say thank you to Charles. It was a great uh, first introduction. Uh, we've all been there. We all have to go from different frameworks and learn something new. And I'm like yourself. I tried many different things. And I found out that Vue.js was probably the framework um, that I probably loved the most. So I tried them all. And I think Vue is my, um, the one that really makes me happy. So today's talk is going to be about the power of SVG. So what we're going to do today, uh, we're going to um, use the SVG within the view, within view, and we're just trying to see how the two can actually make a very powerful component. Before we get started, of course, I'll have to introduce myself. My name is Simone, and I'm a senior JavaScript engineer at Digital Labs. Uh, you can contact me anywhere on Twitter, on my own website, on my email address. I will be happy to answer any question for this topic, for this talk, or anything else. I'm more than happy to actually be in touch with anyone. If you would like a copy of the PowerPoint or anything specific, also get in touch, please. 
So um, the name of the talk is the power of, the, of SVG. And what we're going to try to achieve is to create an SVG with filters and animation to wrap HTML by creating a reusable view component. So it's quite complex as a, um, uh, what we're trying to achieve. And in reality, just, uh, it just been defined as a proof of concept. Um, Everything started, the idea of this talk started when I listened to a podcast, Syntax FM. So I like to listen to podcasts on my free time because it supports me to get up to speed. And in one of those podcasts on episode 154, um, uh, Scott was not available because of his child. So Sarah Zweiden, it's very hard to say her surname, uh, she joined in and she's a very, um, you know, she's a master in SPG. So uh, that 30 minutes chat really, um, triggered in me a, um, um, something and I wanted to try SPG and trying to understand a bit more. So what I did after that, I started to play around and make this proof of concept. Within the, the podcast, they also talk about something um, not very known within the SVG world that is foreign object. So an ability to actually um, inject HTML within the uh, SVG itself. So today, um, today's component is actually built around the foreign object. So we're going to use of that. We're going to use the foreign object to actually uh, be able to inject HTML with view and everything else. As with every talk I do, there's always a disclaimer. So as I just mentioned, I'm not an SVG expert, and most of the SVG knowledge I've done is uh, through research that I've done for this PowerPoint and blog posts and everything else I've done um, uh, post uh, after the podcast. Um, the component is not ready for production, so I've tried it in a couple of browsers and actually seems to be really good. But of course, I would not suggest you to, to use it in production. And um, we're going through, most of the code you will see is, um, is very basic. So of course, you can have multiple enhancements that you can make this, um, you can enhance further. But for the scope of the topic, it's going to be quite, um, quite basic. So today as a, today's agenda, um, we're going to define component. So we're going to define a component from scratch. We're going to construct an SVG, and we're doing it from the bottom up. So I'm going to do a an hybrid live coding. So I'm not actually coding live, but we're going through each steps by I'm commenting and changing some of the code. Um, then um, after we define all the SVG, we're also going to add a little bit of um, filter. So it's going to be some filters effect in it, and we're going to add some anima animation. And to complete it, we're gonna actually going to make it. Uh, we're going to add a little bit of view magic. We're going to add what view is best for. Um, the goal of this talk will be for you to have an introduction to SVG, to um, learn about Vue.js scoped slot if you never heard of it, um, SVG element, as I mentioned before, an object, the filters, and the animation. As I mentioned before, we're just going to touch slightly on each of these topics, so we're not going to go in extreme details, but uh, they will be referenced in documentation where you can go and read, and they've been really, you know, they've been really helpful for myself. The first thing, our first step is to actually define a component structure. Um, I have a very particular way of doing so. So I know many developers that the first thing they do as soon as they write a, you know, either a React or um, a view code, the first thing they do is they define the properties, they define their data, they add loads of view stuff in it, and they make it very beautify, if that makes any sense. What they usually do, I'll do the other way around. I like to start with very plain HTML, I like to probably add a little bit of CSS, and I like to be, build the proof of concept on top of the HTML and CSS. So what you, you will usually see if you ever work with me is you will not see any JavaScript at all until the proof of concept is the way I want it. Doing that uh, supports me in being very flexible and it supports me making components that are very reusable. And I can change my mind without having to spend time going through all the different iterations. The best thing also as well is that I don't leave any code. Um, you know, the code is quite clean because I write it after everything has been done. So the naming of the methods and everything else is actually clean. I usually like to use code sandbox to get started. So this project was started as a code sandbox repo. And then when I see that something actually makes sense and I can spend some time, I usually create a GitHub repo and pull it down. For today's, um, for today's demo, I got a, a CLI um, version three um, application running on my machine and everything is running through there. But as I say, there is a code sandbox as well if someone is interested. So as I say, the first step is going to be um, to actually create the component. So in case uh, some of you don't know, the application is running 
I'm going to show it to you. Okay. So I hope it's big enough. I actually have zoomed it for everyone to see. So um, the application is running in the back background and every time we do some changes, as with all the new framework, they will be hot reload within our browser. I did find that sometimes because of the SVG, uh, the hot reload doesn't really always work. So every now and then we need to either clean the cache or um, open up the, the debugger to keep the cache clean. Um, if you want to get started with the view and you have most of the plugins such as Beautify or uh, an updated issues to the code, as soon as you start to write view, you'll see that actually you have a support scaffold in there. And if I click it, it creates the templates for me. If you ever used view before, you will know that this is the basic template for view. You got HTML, JavaScript, and style. Just to make sure that our component works, we're going to we're going to add something, save it. Uh, what we're going to do, you see that we go, um, we're going to build up our component, and what we're going to do, we're going to uncomment out as we go along the component. So if I save this, and I go in my browser, you see that actually our basic component is working. So as I mentioned before, we start from the very basic. So we're not going to add any um, anything else. We're going to build the SVG in, within the HTML and the CSS. And then at the very end, we're going to add some JavaScript. So this was very basic. I hope you know um, everyone was able to follow me until now. The next step is the fun part. It's actually working with SVG. When I started to search around, I used this SVG in the past, like many of you probably have done. And usually the usage of SVG is for icons. You download something that is already there, of cool, cool, you know, cool animation or anything else. But when you search it, you can see that SVG has a real power. So the definition for Wikipedia is that SVG is a scalable vector graphic, XML based. So it looked very similar with, as, to HTML. The main difference in that, that yes, more attribute that can be, can be passed to their elements. He has a two-dimensional graphic and support interactivity and animation. And we're going to um, play around with animation today. And we're not touching interactivity. But um, if you listen to the podcast, you will also see that it's full of um, other fantastic features. Um, SVG, if you ever use Canvas, it'll probably be very similar to you. So SVG is a collection of little elements. So like in this case, on the left-hand side, what we have, we have a big box, then we go um, rectangles, then we go uh, long lines. So a collection and a collage of all these different elements in different colors make the forms that we actually want to make. I'm going to share later a couple of links and you can see some fantastic work done by people that is amazing thinking that is all created with such small elements. As I mentioned before, it's actually a document type, so you can write it and you can open it with many browsers and you can actually read it through. So it's like if you create an image, but you can actually read the image and modify it. Because you can read it through um, different from an image, will allow us to actually animate it simply because we can actually fetch individual elements, move them, animate them, and apply filters to them. And this is what we're going to do today. It's scalable. Because it actually is, because you define all these elements, you can expand it as much as you want. It's not going to lose any of its, um, its smooth and, and, and um, sharpness. And last of all, it's accessible. So I have not really um, experienced accessibility myself. It was mentioned in the podcast, but apparently because SVG has the ability for you to define text and HTML within itself, you could actually provide a full um, a full text for people that use a screen reader. And because it's a document format, the screen reader can go through and they actually can be used for accessibility for purposes. So it's really a powerful tool. The first and most, most important, probably the hardest part that need to be learned of SVG is the definition of viewport and the definition of viewbox. Personally, I had to read a couple of uh, blog posts before I, first, before I actually understood what that meant. In simple terms, a viewport is like the window that you create to see through. So in this case, as you can see on the left-hand side, the viewport of these little windows on an airplane is everything that you can, you know, is the space in which you can see through the world. The view box is how much of the, the outside world you can actually see. So if I'll give you an example of a, you have a frame and the frame is an A4. So your viewport is going to be the A4 frame. And then your view box is going to be the size of the, the, the painting that you want to put behind it. 
So if your if your if your paint is A4 as well, they will have the same size, so you will be able to see 100% of your of, of your of your um, drawing. But if you take an A5 of a bigger frame, you'll just see a percentage of it. And this is what the viewport and the view box is. So in a way, a view box is a telescope because you can you can you can zoom in and zoom out from the actual picture. Next things to share is the elements. So as I mentioned before, I said that um, SVG is actually created with some basic elements. So these are the simple ones that I managed to find myself. So we go a rectangle, circle, a ellipse, a line, and then we go probably something that is a bit more difficult are those two on the bottom left and bottom right. So we go polyline and a polygon, one of which is a, a set of lines that are connected with each other, and another one is a set of lines that is connected to each other, but actually it close, like the star on the left-hand side. So it's this collection of, um, um, of elements that actually allows us to create a, a bigger picture or a, a, more, um, a more, compact, uh, more complex elements and drawing. What we're going to do today now, we're going to go on the first one, that is the basic, basic shape. So in the basic shape, we're going to define our SVG. And as we define it, we're also going to, um, we're also going to um, define the, the viewport and the view box. So to define an SVG, because it's just a normal HTML element, you can actually define as SVG. There are many, many times to load an SVG within your, um, your page. So you can actually load it as an image in an image tag. Um, you can actually, um, uh, as I'm doing right now, you can do it in line. There are hundreds, well, I think six or seven ways that were shared in the podcast. I'm doing it, doing it in line because we need to use it and we need to add some view uh, on top of it. But as I say, you, I could actually take this file, save it in SVG and someone else could actually use it. The width and the height is going to be the viewport that we shared before. So this is how big is going to be the SVG on our, on our page. And the view box is going to set the X and the Y coordinate of where, what part of the drawing you're actually looking at. So if it's zero, zero, it's going to start from the top left. And then it's going to give a, um, a unit of, a percentage unit of, um, this is not pixel, it's just a, so this is going to be 250 of 600. So it gives a percentage and it will know that anything within it, it will, it's, it's a bit complicated, as I said, you will probably have to go and read a bit more, but this one will, will, provide, um, will provide the size of the inside elements. So it will actually create a proportion for the inside elements. So because of the ratio between 600 and 250, each of these unit will be a, a specific set. It also do that you can define the set. You can put pixel, millimeter, centimeter, or anything within that. But if you don't specify, it will be better. Well, it's, it's better because you follow the same flow and everything is done in proportion. What you have to do as well, um, as I mentioned before, is an, um, is an XML format. And as such, you need, to, you need to define the namespace of the element that you use within that. So in this case, we're just defining the namespace as an SVG. After we define the SVG itself, we're able to add content or elements within that. And in our case, we're going to add a single rectangle. The rectangle takes a width, a height, height, and then in our case, I'm going to fill it with blue so we can actually see it on screen. So if we save this and go back to our screen, you will see that we have a big blue box, okay? Very similar to just a little div. So, so far we've done nothing that could not have been done in CSS, simply in CSS. Moving next, we're going to add some filters. So um, in these slides, we're talking about CSS filters. And the reason for it is because I'm a big fan of CSS filter. So not many people use them. There are many, many people that actually prefer to do changes on images in Photoshop and then export them for a website, not knowing that actually the filters are available within the website that are very powerful. So what you see here is three different filters that are available with the CSS. So with the filter in CSS, you can really play around with the colors of the images. So you can make them grayscale, or you can actually um, modify some of the, the color channels, as in these cases. But they are kind of limited. It is true, it needs to be said that you can actually load SVG filters within CSS, but it's out of scope of this discussion, and we're going to use the SVG filters in the SVG just because it's, it's an SVG talk, and we're going to in those details. But just to let you know, there is an increased uh, support in browsers 
to actually be able to use um, SVG filters within CSS itself. So because we're not that interested in CSS filter, we want to do more, what can really be achieved with SVG filter? Well, SVG filter actually can support you in creating things as, as beautiful and as bold as the one that you could do in Photoshop. The way SVG filters works is there is a set of 15 or 20 filters that all of them, put them together, can actually achieve fantastic, fantastic results. So I'll give you an example. And um, even in this case, there is a reference at the very bottom of the PowerPoint that you can actually look at. So this is a, um, a screenshot taken from the, the, the reference uh, blog post. So if you wanted to replicate the left-hand side font, so a kind of greenish font with a very old look and a, and a nice um, background, blue background, what needs to be done is not a single step. So you have to take the first font and you have to make it pink, uh, uh, green, for example. You have to add a thicken filter, an extrude, an offset, and a subtract. Then you add the color. Then you add the fractional texture and reduce the color. So of course, it's not very simple if you're just starting to get into SVG filters. And it was when I started to look at this, I started to um, be a bit scared. So most of the people will, and probably even myself in the future, I'm not going to apply SVG filters, do them in hand. What you usually can do, there are loads of tools that allow you to apply the filters and play around. And as soon as you have what you really want, you can export the SVG itself. At the end of the, the, end of the top of this talk, I will support you in, um, in doing that kind of process. I will tell you what needs to be done to actually be able to replicate the same component that I've created just by doing, doing that. If you go in our component, the first thing I want to show, share is the actual um, blog post that we're going through. So if you go through, you see some fantastic, fantastic filters that can be done. Each of them or most of them are actually a demo that you can actually go through. So I really support you to go through and read it through. So what we're going now is we're going through our code. As before, we're going to comment out the basic shape and we're starting to play around with filters. Oops. Filters, um, they go by group. So as I mentioned before, as you've seen within, in the previous image, you were able to apply loads and loads of filters. So what you can actually do, you can create a filter group, you can provide it an ID, and then within that, you can put all the different filters that you want to apply. It's very important to realize that the different order in the filters will give a different result. In our case, I've, um, I've not learned how to do the filters from the, from the ground up. What I've done, I've actually been able to take this effect from a different website. Um, and um, as you go through what you actually can do, you call the elements that you want to, um, the filter element that you want to apply. You provide all the different data or properties that that, uh, that a specific filter requires. So in our case, you need to provide the type, a frequency, a number of octaves, and the result itself. To actually make it look even better and is to show you that uh, the filter groups, I have actually applied two different filters. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to remove one. Okay. We're going in our application. So this is the blue shape with the, on, the, the one filter applied to it. And then if I remove this one, that is a different one, so we go into turbulence, is, um, um, he has a scale, he has a channel, and is a displacement map. So if you put these two together, and we save, we actually got a, a, quite like, you know, a nice um, a rectangle with the border um, uh, smoothed out. So it's, it's very interesting how different, um, different filters can create this kind of effect, because if you see the filter individually, you will, you know, I was not able to understand that one plus one would make this, but this is a kind of effect that we're going, we're going to, to create with the filter. So as we go back again, um, the a list of filters can be provided, but it will be quite hard for you to go straight away and create one of those fantastic filters. There's a little bit of studying and understanding of the way how they works and how they actually uh, interact um, between themselves. After we've gone through the filters, the next step is the animation. Sorry, is the foreign object. So um, the foreign object, as I mentioned, is just one of, is an SVG, field, uh, SVG element, 
and it allows you to add any HTML that you actually want. The reality is that you can apply not only HTML, you can apply um, different XML namespaces, but when you actually use it in web, most likely you will be applying HTML. Um, if we go back to our examples, the next one that we're going to do, as I say, is the foreign object. When we go through the foreign object, we see that we have same as before. We have the filter, we have the SVG declaration, and we've got the rectangle. I, I forgot, apologies, I forgot to mention how to apply a filter on a specific element. So as you can see in the rectangle, what we have, we have a filter attribute, and that filter takes an URL, and the URL is then calls an ID of turbulence, because our filter is called ID of turbulence. What is very nice of the SVG is that you can have multiple elements within a single SVG, but you can apply a specific, specific, specific filter and specific animation just to one of the elements itself. So in our case, we're applying it to the rectangle. When you go down, you see that we're going to add a new element, so the foreign object. The foreign object takes the properties of X and Ys and a width and height, so that is you know, um, understandable, very simple to understand what they actually do. And within that, then, you're able to add any HTML you want. Because, as I mentioned before, a foreign object accept more than just HTML, we need to define which namespace we're actually going to use. So what you have to do, you have to define a namespace and you have to add that is the XML, X HTML namespace. Uh, this took a little bit of time to understand and it was, it was working in some browser, not in all, and then I finally realized um, my mistake. So it's very important that you know that you need to declare the namespace. So later on, when we're going to add this lot, we need to make sure that we don't forget that the first element needs to be declared as a namespace. What you can see is that I've actually added a class of color, but there is no CSS in the SVG. So the important, the very interesting things is that when you declare an SVG in line and you declare an ID on HTML within that, that, that HTML will actually be affected by your CSS. So we go down here, you see that I just go normal CSS um, within my components, and this is going to affect the element within the foreign object. So before doing that, I'm going to remove this. So you can see with and without. So as you can see, I go HTML, plain HTML, HTML within something that has been filtered. What you will also notice is that because the filter has been applied just to rectangle and not to the font, the font doesn't look any filtered at all. But if you would like to, we could actually apply this filter or the animation when later we make the animation to the both objects to actually make them all an object group. If I go back now and I add a class of color, that is the one that I defined down there, you can see that it actually takes effect. This is a good thing and a bad thing because of course, um, when using the, uh, when using the foreign object, because you are injecting HTML in something that is proportioned by the viewport and view box, I found it um, a bit complicated to work around with real websites. The main reason for it is because we usually always set the height and width of, of fonts and headings. So it was very complicated when you were passing object to it. But for the proof of concept they were doing, it's fantastic and it's great to see that you're able to actually use CSS within that. After the introduction of the foreign object, what we got left is to something that I always like to do. So I know that we shouldn't animate. I, um, I like to do um, always to introduce accessibility in my website and I really like for the web to always be accessible to everyone. But when I do my proof of concept or when I do something that I know is not going to go out in the world, I always like to add a little bit of animation. Um, as I say, it's unfortunate that we cannot really use it or we need to use it with caution. So the only time that they play around with it is in this case. So we do need to add some animation there. The way you add animation is, um, I would say it's very similar to CSS. So there are very, quite some similarities between the two. So again, very similar to the same. We comment this out and we create a comment, the one with animation. So just to recap, we got SVG, 
we got our filter turbulence and we have our rectangle rectangle and we go with our foreign object what we'll have to do now we have to play around with the animation what i'm doing i'm going to comment this out and i'm going to save so the way animation works the animation is part of animate element and um the way it works is that you're actually able to <clears throat> pardon me uh, you're able to um, define which actually uh, to which element the animation will be linked to. So even in this case, you can animate a single element or you can animate old block or everything else. And in our case, we're just going to animate the rectangle. You declare an ID. So this is not mandatory, but the reason why we declare it because we're going to do multiple animations. So very similar to the, to the filter, you're able to have a mixture of animation, either all starting together or all affecting different elements or all depending to each other. The next thing, next things will be the attribute name. So this is very similar to when you do when you are uh, when you apply an animation in CSS. You have to say which one is the attribute that you want to change with this animation. So in our case, we want to change the ba base frequency of the animation. And then if we overlook this for the for the time being, and after you define which um, attribute you want, you have to define which one is the from and to. So we want to go from to zero twenty to zero forty and we want it to last five seconds. So adding this element and saving it. Dun -dun. Did I comment on it? Mm, let's try. Okay. Here we are. As I say, every now and then there is a little bit of discrepancy. It doesn't really apply. So as you can see, it does work. The only problem is that it goes for five seconds and then it stops. So what we need to do, we can actually apply a different uh, animation later on, and we can actually link the animation by using the start the begin so the beginning attribute is going to say i want this animation to start in these specific times i want it to start when there's zero seconds and i also want it to start when an animation with animate to id ends so if you think about it you can actually make a nice complex um uh, orchestra of animation some one can start one can finish and another one can start and one starts after a specific time but by doing that you will be able to animate all components on a page and make fantastic um, fantastic layout so in our case we're going to create another animation um, we're going to call it animate 2 that is going to be called here we're going to um, let it begin when animate 1 stops so what is going to happen this will start at zero seconds then when this is going to end, this is going to start. And when this is going to end, this is going to start. So we started the never ending loop now. We do the very same thing. So attribute name is going to be the base frequency and we go from 40 to 20. So what it's going to do is going to go from 20 to 40 and then from 40 to 20. And also this is going to take just five seconds. If I save now and go back. So you see that it goes down and then after five seconds, it goes up. So this is just a simple example of animation, but what you will, what I wanted to show is another link that is shared at the very bottom of the PowerPoint. So if you come here, um, this link, I will not suggest you to open it with your mobile phone because um, each and any of these resources actually loads straight away. So I did it myself and the phone was extremely, um, uh, you know, it became extremely hot. So it shows all the different animation that can be provided. And the nice things of it is that it actually provides the code for each of them. So look, all this can actually do, be done. And there we go more. There are some very good animation. Um, look at this. So all this is all done by times and it's all done in the same way. So look at this one for uh, hamburger icon. So there is more and so much that can be done with animation. Um, of course, you need a little bit more time to invest in interest in it. Even this one, there's no JavaScript, it's all animation, it's all CSS, and, uh, uh, sorry, it's all HTML and CSS. So it's fantastic to see. 
Um, going back to our little animation, we've done everything so far. We put animation, we use the foreign object, we've done the filter, but it's a view token, we've done nothing at all with view. So let's do a little bit of it. So what we're going to do, we're going to add a little bit of view magic. Okay, as I mentioned before, I do love view, and the reason why I love view is because of this is simplicity. It's very simple, as it was mentioned before, it's really, really probably the framework that people should use. What we're going to do today, we're going to create a slot, okay? Usually you will be a named slot, but in this case, because it's just a single slot, it will, it will actually be used as the default slot. When you create a component and you create a slot, what it will allow you to do, it will allow you to call a component, like if it was a normal element, such as a div on a, of a, of a, of a span, and then you will be able to pass whichever HTML you want within that component. All the HTML they will pass through will actually be part of the slot. So for our example, we're going to take the foreign object and we're going to create a slot within the foreign object. By doing so, we will be able to call our component and pass whichever HTML we want, and that will be rendered within the component itself. We're going to create some props and we're going to create some of the conditional rendering. So this is just an introduction, as I mentioned before, but it will support you guys in understanding how complex this could actually be become. So there's a mixing that is out of scope, but the idea, if I want to progress this further, is that I will probably create a mixing for animation and a mixing for filter. And in the props, you will be able to pass which filter do you want, which animation do you want, and some other parameters. So going back to our app. I wanted to attempt to do a live coding, but live coding never works. So I wanted to be, I wanted to make sure that the curse would not hit me. So what we're going to do, we're going to create the final component. What you will see is very differently from the other one, this one didn't need it, apologies. Very differently from the other ones, the final component has HTML passed into it. So what we're passing is the, is the view logo, with, the, with some height and size and alt, and also an heading. The reason why we're passing the HTML is because we are taking use of the, of the slot, as I mentioned before. If we go back to the final component, what we see is that we have all the declarations as before. So we have an SVG, we have our filter, we have our animation, we have our rectangle, and we have our foreign object. The main difference now, main and only difference, is that within this div, we actually have a slot. When you declare a slot, you're actually also able to declare some um, default. So in the case in which I would have called the component with no data within that and save it, you see that what is rendering is the HTML work and if we go back to our thing, uh, our code, you will see that the HTML work is the tag that was actually defined as default. But of course, we don't want the HTML work. We want to see the slot working. So we're going to pass some images and some headings. And if we go back, you will see that we have the headings and the images. So of course, this is a proof of concept. So it doesn't really probably make sense. But imagine if you will be able to make, a, you have a website where you show tiles or you have an e-commerce website where you show something that is quite fancy and probably lots of people will have someone behind the scene taking the component put it in photoshop making sure it looks cool with this you could actually create a very fantastic nice effect maybe not with animation if you want to make sure it is fully accessible but nice effect that looks really great and all directly applied on your web browser so it's really powerful and i can see so many usage of it with the right knowledge Going back, sorry, apologies. Going back to our code, what we're going to do as well, we're going to add a little bit of view. So as I mentioned before, the JavaScript is the very last thing that I usually do. So what I've done, I can add a couple of properties. So just a filter properties and an animate property. I can set some default because I don't want to make them de be dependent on them. So they will always have the filter and animation applied. And then actually also defining the, the type. So this is very helpful. Um, to make sure that you can unit test your component and making sure that um, there is no mistakes in the usage of it. So 
the powerful part is that because this is um, at the end of the day is rendered within the HTML as a um, you know it's an SVG and a document base, but the web browser is able to render it and Vue is able to render it itself. We're actually able to use Vue directives and the any any of the Vue power within the component itself. So what you can see is that within the filter, I was able to add a if there is a filter, and within animate, I was able to add if animation is true. So we're actually able not to switch animation and filter on and off. So by going back in our component, so you, you've seen that this one actually worked because as I mentioned before, we have some default set of true. But if we go here now, you see that we're able to pass the components. So we're able to pass animation through and filter through. And if we go back, everything should be working and that's fantastic. But if I go here and say animation false, and save it. Oh, it did, it did update. As you can see, animation stopped. And also, if I don't want the filter, it stops, everything is gone. So it's very powerful, it's, it's, it's great to be able to see what we can achieve. And um, I, was, um, I was amazed by how powerful SVG can actually be. So I think using them for just icons is really, um, is really, and not the most powerful way of using them. And I really support, suggest you guys to go out and search and improve, you know, make some improve a concept and just experience the power of it. As I mentioned at the very start, I'm not a SPG expert. So if any of you knows on a better way to actually do or anything that I've said wrong, please get in touch and more than happy to improve this talk. But my, what I really want to do is show you the power of it and show you that it actually works with you seamless with no problem at all. As I mentioned before, there are some references. You can actually take a screenshot now or because this video is gonna be shared with this DOM media, you will be able to just go back and get them. So everything is shared so far. So everything I mentioned today, so the Syntax FM episodes, um, my blog post where I actually went through this in, in, write, in writing, the SVG filters link, the SVG animation links, and the GitHub repo for these components is all available. As I mentioned before, these are my contact details. I'm more than happy to have um, to be contacted about this or anything else. And I really, really hope you enjoyed the talk. And thank you so much, everyone. Thanks so much, Simone. I really appreciate it. Does anybody have any questions? I don't see any in the chat. Okay, I guess we'll say no then. Thank you so much to Simone and Charles for giving chats today and we will see you next time around.